That's an interesting idea of what silver point is, is once you realize that it's any soft metal drawing on paint, you can make silver point tools out of almost anything. In fact, uh, you can draw with a silver dollar or an old copper penny. I don't think new pennies work. New pennies are made out of zinc or who knows what they're made, they're pink zinc, right? But old pennies are actually made out of copper and you can, you can draw with them. And let me show you exactly what silver point is. So paper, regular old paper. I've got a sheet here of just good quality watercolor paper. Good quality because you want it to last forever. But if you, if you uh, try and draw with silver on regular plain paper, you notice it doesn't really show up. The paper is too soft and the metal itself is too hard. So you have to paint the paper. And once you paint the paper, all kinds of magic things happen. For instance, the paint acts like a very fine sandpaper. It's just abrasive enough to grab atoms of silver or copper or gold or whatever you're drawing with from your thimble, from your coin, or from your silver point drawing tool. And the paint grabs the silver off the tool and the tool deposits the silver on the drawing. So the drawings are literally made out of metal. It's not a scratch board process where you're scratching through the paint to the paper. It's not an engraving or printmaking process like dry point where you're, you're transferring ink or something done with the stylus. You're actually making a drawing out of metal and the drawings tarnish. And that's what's really interesting about silver. And I have examples up here. Oh, you know what, in fact, when I do these demos, I always bring enough to pass around so people can try it themselves. They'll send these around this way. We'll send one from left to right. Grab a tool and try silver point for yourself. And I'll send one around the other way. I always bring a few extra. Here. Try both sides of the paper, because you'll see that the silver is too hard to draw on plain soft paper, and that you'll need to draw on the paint in order to make a mark. So once you've got that done, all you need to do is come up with a tool, and there's all kinds of silver point drawing tools. What I have right here, this is a kind of copy of Albrecht Dürer's tool. There's a very famous portrait of Albrecht Dürer where he's, he's drawing himself, and he's, he's like this oh, yeah. in the mirror. And if you look at the drawing tool, it's a little bit like looking at Roger van der Weyden's tool. What is it? It's not a pen. It's not a pencil. It's not a paintbrush. What is it? It's a stick of metal. And those sticks of metal are called styluses. And generally, one end of the stylus is silver, and the other end is copper. And this particular tool is a copy of Albert Durer's tool, which it just has a silver point at one end. It's a really interesting tool. It's actually made from an antique dental instrument I found in a flea market in Florence, Italy. And then I commissioned a um, jeweler that I knew to make a silver point that I could jam in the end instead of one of those dentist implements of destruction. So it's a really nice kind of handheld tool. But what I use most days is actually this guy right here. Now those of us of a certain age will remember when you took mechanical drafting in middle school, right? And you had to buy a mechanical pencil. And a mechanical pencil has one of these leads in it, two millimeter leads. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a, a, a drawing tool that's got a button on the end and a chuck, right? So in order to make a silver point tool, what you do is you buy one of these for like three or four dollars. You can get them at Hobby Lobby. I think those, these black ones coming around, I bought a bunch of them at Hobby Lobby. They're not too expensive. And you take the graphite out and you throw it away because it's useless. And you get yourself a little piece of silver wire. Now silver wire you can buy at almost any good jewelry supply store. Uh, Rio Grande is one. I think they're, they're based out of uh, New Mexico. And believe it or not, about 12 inches of silver is going to cost you about 10 bucks. I don't know what market price is today. It's probably a little higher, right? Since, what, what, who said? I think it's 30 for an ounce. 30 for an ounce? So this is about half an ounce of silver, so maybe about 15 bucks. So for 15 bucks, you can buy yourself a foot of silver wire that will fit in one of these lead holders. And the lead holders hold two millimeters, so you need to buy yourself 12 gauge silver wire. And you can get sterling which is silver and copper mixed together, or you can get fine silver, which is pure silver. I tend to use sterling because it tarnishes faster. And all you need to do is cut yourself off about an inch of it, 
So from $15 down to about, what, maybe $1.50? In a $3 lead holder you get from Hobby Lobby, and you've made yourself a silver point tool for about five bucks. And this will last you forever, because one of the great benefits of working in hard metal is that you don't need to sharpen it every five minutes while you're working on a fine line drawing. Or you gotta straighten it out, because you know they, they curl it into a loop to send it through the mail, it's maddening. I just wish they'd send it in a straight stick. It doesn't have to be sharp. It, well, that's the next step I'm getting to, is if you run your fingertip over the top of this silver tip, and just run your fingertip over it, you feel that catch? Mm -hmm. That little burr, you have to take their word for it, because I'm not going to pass oh. this around. It's very, very sharp. And in fact, this will scratch right through the paint and, in, and right through the paper and just create a furrow, almost like you're making an engraving. So the next step you want to do is you want to take a file, just a regular old mill bastard file, and take that burr off the end. And the way I do it is I turn my hand into a little, like a drill bit, so that the, the tip is always moving, and I'm holding the file at an angle. So I'm teaching you everything you need to know to do silver. I used to do this, the first time I ever did this was from my own uh, drawing class when I was a, a graduate student at Syracuse University. I used to teach a figure drawing class. Anybody know Syracuse University? This used to be, when I was on the East Coast, a lot of people, you know Syracuse University? Okay, so Kraus College has this huge tower, and on the fourth floor, windows that overlook all of Syracuse, because Syracuse is up on a hill, they taught figure drawing in that room. I taught figure drawing in that room. And I would teach my students how to do silver point. So I was passing it on just like Paul Cadmus passed it on to my teacher, and my teacher passed it on to me. That was a great class. I used to take them over to the Gross Anatomy Lab at SUNY Health Sciences. You know, because when we were doing figure drawing, we'd have to draw the cadavers. And I would tell them, all right, next week we're going to go over and we're going to draw the cadavers. And the students would be like, okay, all right. So class would show up, you know, 20 students in the class. And the day we would go over to the Gross Anatomy Lab, um, I'd get about 10 students. Because, you know, 10 of them were like, I'm not going to go today. And I'd say, okay, we're going to march over there. And it was, you know, it was about 100 yards away. And so we would go over. And by the time I get to the SUNY Health Science Center, there'd be about five students. You know, five of them were just like, I, I don't really think I want to do this. And so we'd go in the building, me and these five students, and we'd go down and we'd walk all the way down to the basement. And we'd meet Dr. Benzo, who was the anatomy teacher. And I'd look around and there'd be like two people behind me. And I thought, well, this is just about right, you know, because... I, I, I don't really want to have to teach that many people. And then Dr. Benzo would say, all right, everybody, I want you to put your mask and your gloves on. And he would open the doors to the gross anatomy labs and you would see all the cadavers with the sheets on. And I'd look around and it'd be just me. <laughs> and I would go in there and I would make silver point drawings from the cadavers. And that was, that was what teaching silver point to students at Syracuse University was like. Except for one year, I had a student who went all the whole, through the whole thing. He was just like, oh, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. I said, oh, you're a little nutty, aren't you? <laughs> so all, yeah, just by, all the while I've been doing that, I've been polishing this point down to what is almost a pencil point. And the last thing I want to do is just round that over a bit and then take a piece of emery paper and polish that burr right off the, right off the end. Now run your finger over that, that point, and it's smooth like a tiny, tiny little ball bearing. And that is exactly what you want to make a silver point drawing tool. And once that's done, you can make fine line drawings with that point, and it will last you literally hours and hours and hours and days and days and days, a week of eight hour days, and you won't dull that point and you can make the finest line cross-hatching of drawings that you want to make. Uh, and you'll never have to look up and sharpen your pencil and keep going. I know artists who work in pencil, they'll have a table full of sharpened pencils, and they'll just grab the next one and keep going. Silver point, you can be in the zone for hours and hours and hours, and that's what I like about it. And interestingly enough, you can make multiple kinds of points. For instance, on all my silver points, I point one end to a very, very fine point, and the other end is a very, very broad, almost like a little ball bearing point. And what's interesting about that is the different shapes of the points 
give you different kinds of marks. So you can have a broad mark, such as uh, one of the drawings we looked at where the artist, uh, which one was that? Where the artist had, oh, Leonardo, of course, had a very, very broad, dark mark. And, um, oh, I can't remember. Ah, the names, the names, they just go. Um, Joseph Stella. Joseph Stella had a really interesting way of just holding his drawings together with one fine outline all the way around the portrait. And he was using basically a blunt silver point tool to do that. And then he would flip the tool around and he would apply fine cross hatching to develop those delicate tones. But once you realize that you can shape your point any way you want, you can have points that are chisel points, you can do interesting things like for instance, if you can draw with any metal, and brass is any metal. This is my old house key, my old back door key from my, my house where I grew up. I've taken a file and filed notches all across the top of it. And I can use that to do instant cross hatching. Cool, huh? And this kind of, yeah, I mean, so if you want to cheat and have like a mechanical device to do your cross hatching, and I'm going to let all you guys try this stuff and, you know, after I'm done explaining. You can, do, you can make marks with anything, and even your old silver dollar, which if anybody has one of these, you know, it's good. You can get yourself a tasty cake with this or hold on to it and eventually buy yourself an entire car. A silver dollar has that wonderful serrated edge that does the same thing and makes multiple fine hatching lines. And you can also use it a little bit like a piece of charcoal to get a very broad line and then immediately switch to a kind of calligraphic line. See, I was serious when I said move in. Just come right on up. You can even stand behind me if you want, which is probably the best point of view. So all kinds of neat drawing tools. And in fact, there are metal wools. Bronze wool, which those of you with boats know, is what you want to use to prep the hull of your boat because it doesn't rust like steel wool. Bronze wool will draw as a metal point tool. And it gives this really soft, cloud-like kind of mark. Mm. And there are other kinds of metal wools. There's aluminum wool, which you can find. There's copper wool. But bronze is the kind you can buy at your True Value hardware store. You know, and you can make wonderful drawings with it. Imagine developing a landscape drawing where you use this to put in all the leaves of the trees and then all you have to do is you know, draw a trunk on your tree and you're done. So I've shown you silver, I've shown you bronze, but you can draw with gold. Where's gold up there? Gold is a really interesting metal to draw with because it sounds fantastic. This is, this is I think, 23 gauge gold, which is a very, very fine gold wire. Um, and you know, it's, when you buy it as that fine wire, it's not terribly expensive. I think gold just topped $2,000 an ounce. So this is, this is not even a dollar's worth of gold. It's just a really fine little wire. And it fits in one of these Pentel lead holders, which is really kind of interesting. And this is, you know, this is a lifetime and a half's worth of gold. I remember once I went to a jeweler, a jeweler I think where I used to live in New York, and had him draw out uh, a gold coin for me, you know, like a, like a $10 gold coin. And he put it through a, a, a jeweler's die, and he kept pulling it until it was uh, two millimeters, like one of these. And I think I spent like $120. That was the last time gold was this high, which was, I think, 2008. So it shows you gold goes up, and it goes down, and it goes up. So buy low. When you're, when you're getting your gold point made, buy low. But the truth is you only have to have a little fine wire in order to draw with gold. Because you're only using it to do a little bit of hatching. Now what's different between gold and silver as a metal? Tarnishing. Like, yeah, tarnishing. Why is it that we all have jewelry made out of gold but not so much jewelry made out of silver, although fine silver doesn't tarnish that much, because gold doesn't tarnish. So gold will always look just like I'm putting it down right now. It will never change. And I have here, when is this from? Do I have it written down? Oh my gosh. Not only can I remember anything, I'm almost blind. 2013, oh, this isn't the oldest one I have, 
But here's, 20, here's, a, here's a, a little sample of metals that I made in 2013, now almost 10 years ago. Silver, on, the, on your left, is that left? I have no idea. Silver has tarnished to be a warm brown. Copper, in the middle, notice it turns a little green, but it also fades. Copper is a very volatile metal. It tends to, as it, as it oxidizes, it tends to evaporate. It disappears over time. And so, silver, so copper will not only turn a little bit green, but it'll get light. And then all the way over here on the right side is gold. And gold looks exactly like it does when I put it down in 2013. It never changes. And it, what's interesting about that is you can mix metals in your drawing and come up with interesting effects. Like a lot of times, I will draw the shadows in gold and, the, and the, the object itself in silver to create a different effect. Warm and cool almost, like the, like the Hesdin drawing. And here's a really old drawing. I don't know when this is written down, but this was a lobster we had. Uh, we, I made lobster ravioli when I asked my wife to marry me. That was our engagement dinner. And this was the lobster that I then made into ravioli. Right? And I drew little bits of it. So this drawing has to be at least 25, 26. I have no idea. 26? 26 years old. And you can see the copper drawing in the middle is almost gone. It's green and it's completely disappeared. And the two drawings in silver point have just gotten a little bit warmer over the years. Mm. Now this drawing is on a really interesting kind of paper because this is that clay-coated paper that Winsor Newton used to make. And in addition to making silver point paper, which I'm going to show you how to do in a minute, you can buy papers that work for silver point that are already made. Clay coated papers like McCoy, Sennelier makes a clay coated paper, and it's clay coated on both sides. And there's even an Italian paper called Plike, P L I K E, means plastic like, because it's a paper made out of non cellulose materials, and it comes in colors. White is traditional, and there's a buff color, and it also comes in colors like black and red and tan and gray, and interesting stuff. I'll show you more about those in a minute, but right now I want to get started with teaching you how to make your own silver point paper, because I've taught you how to make a tool. You can make your own silver point drawing tool. And I've shown you that you can use any metal, and if you don't even have a drawing pencil, you can use a penny one cent silver point drawing tool. But what I haven't shown you how to do is how to make silver point paper like I do, or like Fra Filippo Lippi did, or all of these guys. And if you remember, I told you it was bone ash and spit. That's what Sanino and Sanini told you to do. So I've got some bone ash here, and if anybody wants to volunteer some spit, it's a very dry Colorado winter day, so we don't have any. No, I'm not gonna make paper out of bone ash and spit. I just bring these to show you. What I'm going to use is paint. Now you can use almost any kind of paint. Gesso works. Gesso is a uh, real good quality gesso. It's wonderful as a silver point ground. Um, regular old acrylic gesso that you get at the art supply store works. They even make silver point grounds. Uh, Golden Paints makes a silver point ground that comes in a bottle. I had the privilege of, of test marketing uh, the original formula of this where I used to live in upstate New York, is right up the street from New Berlin, New York, where the Golden Manufacturing Company is. And Mark Golden sent me a bottle of this, a prototype. And I tried it out, and I told him it wasn't that good, and he never spoke to me again. <laughs> and then, then they started manufacturing it. And he actually bought one of my silver points, which was really nice of him. But this is an acrylic-based silver point ground, like all golden materials are. They're made out of acrylic. And I'm not crazy about acrylic grounds because I work on paper, and acrylic tends to make paper curl. Yeah. So I use... What about the paper? What kind of paper? Oh, yeah, uh, thanks. I omitted that. Oh. But this is good quality watercolor paper. Okay. But while I'm still talking about paint, I use casein paint. And casein is an interesting paint because it's a water-based paint made from milk. And what's, yeah, and it's, it's nice. It's an all natural material. And casein paints have been around for 5,000 years. The, the walls of Egyptian pyramids are painted in casein paint. It's one of the oldest, most durable paints that exists. And it's relatively inexpensive. And what's nice about it being water based is it's also air permeable, which acrylic paints aren't. 
So when you paint a sheet of paper, it can continue to absorb water and let water go, and the paper always stays flat. And what's nice about casein paint is it dries super hard. So it's a great surface on which to scratch with a metal stylus because it's hard, it's water-based, it's inexpensive, and good quality casein like this stuff from Shiva has a really high pigment load, so it's nice and opaque. Now there's a question about paper. As I've mentioned, you can draw, on, you can paint any surface whatsoever. A lot of people use tempered hardboard. This stuff you've come across. Uh, people who do uh, tempera paintings, egg tempera, uh, or other kinds of uh, like gouache paintings, they use tempered hardboard. And they will put many, many coats of gesso on this and then draw on it with silver point. One of the artists who is featured in, a, in our book, and a good friend of mine, if I, if I don't mind saying, is Ku Shadler, who is, I would say, as much of an evangelist of egg tempera painting as some of us are evangelists for, let me see if I can find it. She's in the mixed media section which is chapter five. There she is. This is an example of one of Ku Shadler's egg temper paintings with silver point. She's a, she's a, a master, an, a, an unequivocal master of egg temper painting. And she works mostly on panel. And silver point is what she uses for underdrawing. Because once you get the panel of untempered hardboard gessoed, gesso is a wonderful surface for drawing with metal point. So that's a surface you can work on. I have always used watercolor paper because it's good quality paper. It'll last hundreds of years. If you want your drawings to last 500 years, like, uh, like Albert Durer's drawings, you gotta work on the good stuff. So I use Fabriano 140 pound hot press watercolor paper. And if you know what all those numbers mean, uh, 140 pounds means 144 sheets of it weighs 144 pounds. The thinner the paper, the lower the weight. Like 90 pound paper is, is kind of about two sheets of printer paper. What, uh, printer paper is what? It's like 50 pound paper. So that's loose leaf paper is about 50 pounds. 140 pound watercolor is starting to get a little stiffer, a little thicker. And I know people that work on 300 pound watercolor paper. That's the heavy duty stuff. That stuff's crazy expensive. I mean, when I started working on watercolor paper, it was like $3 a sheet, and now it's up to, I don't know, like, like $8 a sheet. So, I mean, that's crazy expensive if you're an artist, especially if you're working with a $5 tool, you know, <laughs> and you don't want to spend any money on your artwork. But 140 pound is about medium weight, good quality watercolor paper. Hot press refers to the surface. Watercolor paper is notorious for being rough, so that as you paint over it, you get all those wonderful pools of color and the texture of the paper. Hot press means before the paper is, is finished being produced, they put it through a hot roller which presses it smooth and flat. I think I have two sheets here of this, don't I? Yeah, so I'll pass one around so you can feel what 140 pound hot press watercolor paper feels like. Good quality stuff. So you take the paper, and because you're going to be covering the entire surface with paint, you want to tape it down to a stiff board on all sides. If you don't, as you paint over it, it'll start to curl up on you, and you won't be able to... Oh, I'm running out of time. Let me, uh, let me speed this up a little bit. Because you're covering the entire surface with paint, you want to make sure it's taped down, and you want to make sure enough of the paper is taped down. I'm using just regular old packing tape because it's waterproof, right? And it's clear so you can see how much of the paper you have under the tape. And I try to get about a half inch of paper under the tape. Because once you cover an entire sheet of paper with paint, it's gonna wanna pop off that board. So you gotta make sure you have enough. Sorry, I didn't bring scissors, just teeth. I've got this one dull eye tooth that I've been doing this for 30 years with. <laughs> I gotta sharpen it every now and then with my, with my file. Get your file out. Yeah. Well, sometimes when I would teach students how to do this, they would want to maximize the amount of paper they have to use. So they'll put like just a little eighth of an inch of paper under the tape. And as soon as the paint hits that, the thing just pops right up. What I learned from moving to Colorado from upstate New York is that you have no humidity here. So in New York, you could tape a piece of paper down, it would take seven days to dry. 
Out here, it takes about seven minutes to dry. <laughs> so lately, I've been taking to stapling the paper down all around the edges. So once you get your paper taped down on all edges, and this is the same if you're, if you're preparing a 30, 22 by 30 sheet or a tiny little sheet like this. You want to tape it down all around a margin and then mix your paint. Like I say, I use casein paint. You can use gesso paint. You can use house paint. I just got through testing a, an alkyd paint I bought at Ikea. It works beautifully. Mm. Cheap, too. You know, it's like nine bucks for a little, little pint. I'm cheap as far as art supplies go. Not cheap as far as household paint goes. So casein paint comes out looking a lot like oil paint. It's a very, very thick. Too thick to brush onto a piece of paper. So you have to thin it down. Now this is where everybody emails me questions days later. Is like, how much do you want to thin this down? And what I recommend is that you use equal parts water and paint. So if you've got an ounce of paint, you use an ounce of water, a shot of water and a shot of paint. And what you're aiming for is to get the consistency of whole milk. Skim, skim milk is too thin. Half and half is too thick. You want whole milk, like we used to drink. Could you tint that if you wanted it? I almost always do. One of the reasons I tint paper is not only because I love Leonardo's blue and Fra Filippo Lippi's red, it's because when you, when you see tinted paper, you become aware that there's paint on the paper, that the drawing is made on top of paint on top of paper. For a while, I was, I was even just kind of leaving the edge all painty and decorative, but that seemed artificial to me, so shtick you know, rather than, rather than fine art. So now I just paint right up to the tape. But when you get your paint mixed to the right consistency, it'll still run off the brush, which it wouldn't right out of the tube. And if you paint it on the inside of the jar, it will be opaque when held up to the light. And that's how you know your paint is just the right consistency. And also, you know, an ounce of paint and an ounce of water makes about an ounce, and I, here, I'll put that there makes about an ounce and a half of prep. This is called preparation. A silver point preparation is your liquid paint. And you can use rabbit skin blue and bone ash. You can, your preparation could be made by golden. Your preparation could be thinned house paint. It doesn't matter what it is. When you tint your paint, what do you tint it with? Oh, let's tint it. Let's put some color in it. I use good quality watercolor because, stay right there, don't move. Because good quality watercolor is mostly pigment. There's a little bit of gum arabic in there to hold it all together. But it's not like squirting acrylic paint or house paint or something into there. It's just a tiny little bit of what is almost pigment. And because it's tube watercolor, it's already been mulled, ground as fine as possible. And it's already a little bit fluid so that when you mix it into your silver point prep, there, see I'm using, you're already picking up the lingo. Right? When you mix it into your silver point prep, it's going to dissolve rather rapidly so that you can work. I have used powdered pigment, and I have mulled it, and I have sat there, and I have drops of distilled water and ground that stuff down into the finest powder possible. And sometimes I do that just because I really want to kind of nerd out on how they used to do this in the old days. And I'll mix my bone ash in and all of this stuff. But mostly, I just want to get the drawing done. So I mix a little tube watercolor in there. Not too much. You don't want it too dark. You want the silver to show up. And then a wide, flat brush, like one of these two inches, two inch wide squirrel hair brushes. You don't want to use a bristle brush because as you're painting the prep on, you don't want brush strokes. Brush strokes will interfere with how fine your silver point cross hatching is. So you need a soft, wide brush like one of these Lang Nickel squirrel brushes. And watch how I'm doing this. I'm painting in one direction and then overlapping my strokes in the other direction, painting edge to edge, trying to get that surface as flat and as even as possible so it's indistinguishable from a sheet of paper. Most cases, I will use two coats. I will let this coat dry and you can tell when a, when a coat of paint is dry because if you hover your hand over it, you can feel it evaporating and it will be cool. Mm -hmm. When it is room temperature, that's when you know you can put the second coat on. It takes about five minutes. 
And you don't want to let it dry completely because if you paint paint over paint, they won't bond completely. But if one, if the undercoat is still a little bit uncured, the top coat will bond right with it. And you want that because you don't want to scratch through one layer of paint down to the second layer of paint. So I'll let this sit about five minutes till the gloss is off. I'll feel that it's dry and then I'll put a second coat on. And then with most paints, you still have to let them dry. With casein, 24 hours at the minimum before it's hard enough to draw on. With alkyds or acrylics, you could probably get away with a few hours. There have been times when I've been in a rush that I've put it in the oven and let it evaporate, but th that's just crazy times, you know. I, th there's no drawing emergency that's that pressing. <laughs> Although sometimes, you know, the, the, the muse hits you and you just want to get back to work. So a second coat goes on, it sat for 24 hours, boom. It's like a cooking show where they pull the yeah. paper off underneath. And this is what you have. You have a sheet of paper. It's perfectly flat. There's one of my dog's hairs on it. It's get everywhere. I've sent my dog's hairs all around the world. And you'll notice that the, it's so indistinguishable from a sheet of blue paper. And then the last thing you want to do is you want to take the tape off before you start drawing. Now, the same guy who taught me how to silver point taught me how to take tape off paper. And if you pull the tape at a 45 degree angle to the paper, it will never tear the margin. If you pull it straight up, it'll pull the margin off along with all the paint. So that has two coats on it then? This has two coats of exactly the same stuff you just saw me make. I made this a couple days ago, just to have one ready. And voila. And if you've done it right, the paper's flat. It's not going to, there's another one of those dog hairs. It's crazy. Gets everywhere. I don't even. He's never even been in the studio. They just travel with me. And then I'll show you a little bit about how to make a silver point drawing. I, I brought three things because I haven't. I never have any idea what I want to draw. But I think an apple is wrong because the paper's blue, and this is just boring. I don't even know what kind of ball that is. So I think I'll draw a little. This is a uh, bobcat skull. Right? So, you know, when they jump out of the trees and attach themselves to your neck, that's mostly fur. This is, this is what the skull looks like. When I start my drawings, I tend to start in one of two different metals. Lately, I've been using palladium. Now, palladium is in the platinum group of metals. It's a jeweler's metal. It doesn't tarnish, and it's very, very faint. Really interesting kind of metal. Historically, I used copper because copper fades, as I've shown you. So if, if I make the underdrawing in copper, in 25 years, no one will see my mistakes. <laughs> but lately, I've been using palladium. I really kind of like it as a metal. I also have some platinum, which is boring. Platinum's just like gold. It doesn't tarnish. It's not interesting. And it's way too expensive. Palladium is about half the cost of platinum. But I'll use copper. And my copper point, believe it or not, is just Romex. It's 12-gauge Romex wire that you buy at the True Value hardware store. You can go in and ask them, uh, say, oh, you know, I, I, I've got to compare gauges. Give me a foot of Romex, and they'll give you a free silver point tool. And then you just <laughs> cut off a little bit, or not. I mean, because it comes wrapped in, in plastic, you can just use it like that. Just cut yourself off. It is 99.5% pure copper, because it has to carry a current. And it's the same gauge as your lead holder. I think I've had this piece for my whole life. So to start my drawing, just sketch very, very lightly with copper, knowing that it's going to disappear one of these days. Am I taking up too much time? It's already 10 after 7. I want to give everybody a chance to try this. So I made up these really interesting things. I bought a, a, I bought a, um, a playing card punch, which is like this big gadget that you use to make uh, punches, and the old silver point drawings they throw away, I've taken and punched out uh, little, little clean pieces of it. So every little card you see here, these are, these are like trading cards, right? They're uh, prepared pieces of silver point paper, and I brought in a whole bunch of these little styluses. So I want everyone to give this a shot and try this. You can even take one of these home with you if you want to try it later. 
try out some silver point drawing to see what it feels like because you'll notice it doesn't quite feel like pencil. It's got a little bit of resistance because you're actually drawing with metal on paint. So it's got a completely different type of feel to it than drawing with pencil or pen and ink or any of the other kinds of media. So a drawing starts with a sketch. This is a sketch in copper. You notice it's very light. You can almost not see it. I've gone nearly blind over 30 years of doing this. So lately I've taken to working with an optivisor on. But the sketching is very, very light. And once the sketching is done, I want to show you a little bit about how to crosshatch. You know, I, I, I know you guys have probably taken art classes before and you know all this stuff. But indulge me for a second. Because crosshatching with silver point is one of the main ways you develop tone. Because the medium is so light, in order to build up any darks whatsoever, you have to layer multiple marks over top of one another and build them up by removing the visible amount of paper underneath. And in order to do that with the kind of control, watch how I hold the stylus all the way back at the end. Holding the stylus up close gives me a little quarter inch mark, little tiny hatches. Holding it about halfway with the same hand motion, I can get about a one inch mark. And I can see the point so clearly that I can place each one of those marks about a 64th of an inch apart consistently. But, but holding the stylus all the way at the end, I can make very large curving marks and still develop that kind of control to be able to make broad areas of hatching so that as I draw the skull and begin to layer in my darks, do it through adding hatching over the surface. And what's great, silver points are small, so rather than have to contort my hand around to change the direction of my marks, I could just move the paper. It's just like those little sketchbooks you saw from the 13th century, except you're making it all yourself. So you do this for hours and hours and hours, you know, eight hours a day, every day, and then you'll eventually end up with your first silver point drawing. <laughs> and then an interesting thing starts to happen is once that drawing is made, the silver begins to react. My ball is going to roll off the table. The silver is going to begin, do I have an old one? To react with the sulfides in the air, and you're going to get a tarnished silver point drawing so that those denser areas of silver point drawing begin to show up as a little more sepia colored. And this drawing is maybe five years old. I, have, I can't tell you. I don't, I, I'm not sure if I dated it. Is it now 2015? Yeah, so this is about seven years old. And it started to tarnish. And after about 10 to 15 years, you'll see the entire drawing start to go a little bit brown which is a really lovely effect. And in this drawing, I've mixed metals a little bit so that you get a difference between kind of gold, which never changes, and silver, which changes quite a bit. As, as you're drawing, do you have to worry about smearing the, the silver? I mean, it's absolutely not. Right. I mean, like with graphite, you know. With graphite, you always yeah. have to worry about where your hand is. Yeah. Silver does silver not. Do you can smudge silver. You have, to, you have to develop it really dark, and you have to really apply pressure. Uh -huh. And what you're doing is you're smudging the paint underneath that carries the silver with it. Which also brings up another point about silver. I don't know why I brought this drawing. I'll show you this one in a second. Is silver doesn't, doesn't correct. It does erase. You can take a regular eraser, and you can remove that silver. But you're also removing the paint mm -hmm. at the same time. So if you want to go back and make a correction, watch what happens. Yeah. You can't draw over your correction. Mm -hmm. So you have to do your drawing perfectly the first time mm -hmm. or start over. Yeah. But there are wonderful things you can do with erasing through yeah. the ground to create highlights. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you're really careful, you know, you can, you can bring out just a glossy, this is why I draw the apple, because it has these glossy little highlights. 
but you can go back and develop a chiaroscuro type drawing by erasing through the ground down to the paper. Really interesting stuff. And if you wanted to, you could mix up and add paint on top of it because you're painting on top of paint and that's, that's perfectly allowed. The last thing I want to show you is, I talked a little bit about those commercial clay-coated papers. Commercial clay-coated papers are not good quality papers. They, as I said, watercolor paper tends to be 100% rag cotton paper. It lasts for 500 years. The clay-coated papers are sulfite papers, they're wood pulp papers. Mm -hmm. And even though it's got a clay coating on them, they will yellow. This paper used to be white. Mm -hmm. It's now yellowed over the years. And you'll notice what happens to the silver. The silver has tarnished so completely because the sulfite paper has so much sulfur in it that it creates silver sulfide, which is what tarnish is. Mm -hmm. So working on top of these commercial clay-coated papers, you can develop tarnish faster, but the paper deteriorates sooner. So it's always this kind of happy medium between the drawing won't last, but it looks beautiful while it exists. Best advice I can give you is if you want to create tarnish in your, in your drawings, you finish your drawing and you just leave it out. You tack it up in your studio and just let it to the open air for a few years and it'll begin to tarnish naturally on its own. I get questions all the time about how do I artificially age a drawing. And sure you can. You can, you can use jeweler's liver of sulfur and expose the drawing to it, but it will yellow the paper as well and help to deteriorate it. So this is an old. I think this is, do I have a date on this? I don't. Maybe, maybe I've dated the drawing, but it's got to be from around 2006 or 7, because that's my old model, Julia, who uh, used to draw in New York, and uh, I haven't drawn the figure in many, many years, because, you know, you need models. So instead of models, I have skulls. Or if you, take it, if you get a chance to look at the show, I've been making my own models out of things like cut paper and, uh, um, you know, all kinds of interesting things like I'll wrap paper. Oh, that's why I brought this drawing. I'll take paper and wrap it around an orange and draw it. And that's all that is, tissue paper wrapped around an orange and tied on both ends. Or I'll make little paper sculptures and light them and draw them as well. And that's the drawings that are in the show. They're uh, called um, two-part inventions because one part is the the actual object, and then there's another part that's a little diagram under the drawing. And there's also some studies in the show which are more like this. Ah, I went really quickly. Does anybody have any questions? Is it not only the, the air that helps tarnish, but sun, does sunlight make a difference? I mean, sunlight can hurt paper. But sun, sunlight can darken paper. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you leave a drawing exposed to sunlight, the paper will darken, which will reduce the contrast of the drawing. If you look at some of the old master drawings, mm -hmm. you'll see that that's the case in those yeah. drawings as well, that the paper tends to darken. And with that, you know, it can tend to darken even the paint underneath of it. Yeah. Um, mostly, it is sulfur in the air. Silver sulfide is what tarnish is. Um, back in New York State, of course, the air is disgusting, so the drawings would tarnish within days. Out here in Colorado, the air is thin and clear and absolutely perfect, and the drawings take forever to tarnish because there's, uh, there's nothing in the air that will damage them. And drawings tarnish faster in moist air, so uh, moist air will carry more particulates as well. Good questions. If you want to try any of my materials, uh, please feel free. If you want to look at any of the books I have up here, the catalog from the uh, National Gallery show is up here, as well as the handbook that I helped write. Um, I wrote five-eighths of that book, so a little more than half. And I've got tools, interesting things such as platinum and gold and palladium that you can try on those little pieces of paper. And I'll be available for questions as I pack up my stuff. And please enjoy the show and all the other shows that are out there. Thank you all for attending. It was nice to have you here.